I, however, believe the words of this revelation as it comes to a close. And Jesus Christ says in Revelation chapter 21, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. I am, in other words, the starting point of life. It wasn't on the banks of the Nile. It was within the council of triune God. For God created the heavens and the earth. The worship of the stars and planets, by the way, are going to one day utterly, completely collapse. Creator of heaven and earth. Some people seem to completely disregard that fact. Instead of worshiping the Creator, they worship the creation. God gave us this planet as our habitat. He told us to care for it and have dominion over it. It's important as Christians that we keep the earth and our relationship with the earth in proper perspective. This earth is our temporary home. Humanity will not live on this earth forever, and we'll learn more about that today. This is Wisdom for the Heart with Stephen Davey. Stephen is in a series from the book of Revelation, and today's lesson is called No More Earth Day. I found it interesting in researching this subject this week that every day when the sun rises over Washington, D.C., its first rays fall on the eastern side of the city's tallest monument by design. It's the Washington Monument, 555 feet in the air. And the architects and the committees wanted those first rays to catch and reflect the eastern side of that aluminum capstone where these words are inscribed, Laos Deo, which is Latin for praise be to God. I think it's in Latin so most people can't read it and sue the state to have it removed, frankly. But imagine, the first thing to catch the sunlight in our capital are words that speak praise to our God. You think that happened today? It probably would be declaring some kind of praise to the sun, S-U-N, or to Mother Nature. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, there is no question that fallen man... And we're not dealing with this in our sermon, but I will say it because it's true. There's no doubt that fallen man has failed in his God-given stewardship over the earth. We under him steward earth. We are to enjoy the earth. We failed in our ability to enhance uh, the earth, its beauty and resources. However, and I'm not excusing mankind's failure, but you need to understand this shocking truth. The damage mankind has done to this planet is in no way comparable to the damage that will be done to the planet by God. He will destroy more water than man ever polluted. He will level more trees than we ever planted. He will destroy more species of animals we ever preserved. In fact, he will destroy most of the earth and the universe until in the sum, summation of his judgment, he will destroy the rest of it and then recreate a new heaven and a new earth for us to enjoy forever. Amen. Here's the greater irony, though, to me, is that God will use nature, mankind's chief source of idolatry, He will use nature to punish mankind. The very thing that man revered will turn and bite him in these coming judgments. The very earth that man placed all of his love and cherished attention upon will one day become the very weapon of judgment in the hand of creator God. Mankind has come to cherish and revere the earth and God will use the idol of earth to judge the human race. They will have worshipped mother nature. She will not be benevolent. Their idol mother will be used by God to destroy them. We've arrived at even more terrifying judgments in our study in Revelation. Let's pick it up at chapter 8 as the first archangel blows on that first trumpet. And this first trumpet, if you're taking notes, 
impacts the earth's surface. We're going to deal with four trumpets all in one sermon at lightning speed, and that is a miracle in and of itself. All right, look at verse 7. The first trumpet sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned now, at this point, remember, ladies and gentlemen, we are well into the tribulation. We're actually over the, over the halfway point of the tribulation. And you notice here the implication is there are plenty of trees, there's plenty of water, plenty of foliage, implying rainfall, water, and the normal cycles on the planet. It's in full working order. All the way into the middle part of the tribulation... And then following the tribulation, Christ will reign at the end of that thousand-year reign. A new heaven and a new earth will be created. So we're well into the tribulation here. Let me make a couple more comments. There isn't anything about this language, by the way, that, that shows us that these plagues are just symbolic. That they aren't literal. That they don't literally happen. There isn't anything in the language of that sort. They, they are no more symbolic than the plagues of judgment on the land of Egypt centuries earlier real frogs real hail real lice real locusts real darkness real death now many commentators like to read into revelation chapter 8 everything from nuclear war to nuclear fallout and it is even more sensational than just taking it at face value there may very well be a nuclear war sometime in the future of of the planet But there's no reason to believe that these judgments here are anything more than literal God-ordained judgments in which he uses the elements of nature to carry out his judgment. In fact, if you look at verse 7, the syntax indicates that the blood and the hail and the firestorm were created in heaven and literally hurled to the earth. Look at verse 7 again. The first sounded and there came hail and fire mixed with blood and they were thrown to the earth. Can you imagine satellite networks picking up this storm hurtling toward earth? Real hail, real fire, real blood. It'd be horrifying. And what's going to happen? Well, you might circle the phrase or underline the phrase one third in your text. It's significant here in this entire chapter, and it'll appear over and over and over again. In verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12, you'll see it appearing over and over. The the repeated use of this phrase clearly communicates to us that the results of these judgments are not random, just sort of random natural events, but they are carefully designed divine judgments. They are meted out for specific results, and one-third of different things are affected. Now, the amazing thing is that when you study these judgments, it's that two-thirds survive. But we do know that God holds it back. In fact, it's a demonstration of his mercy. And it can only go so far, and only one-third will be affected. And so this first trumpet signifies a terrifying storm. It will create forest fires all over uh, the planet, destroying trees and foliage. And there will no doubt be seminars and conferences and emergency sessions of the United Nations if they are not... If it's not defunct by then, news documentaries and people everywhere desperately trying to cope with the incredible damage to Earth's ecosystem. This is just the beginning of the archangel's trumpets. And while this first trumpet brings devastation to green foliage on the planet, the second trumpet brings terror to the oceans of our world. Look at the second trumpet which impacts the oceans in verse 8. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now here's one of the similes, one of the few similes that John uses in this passage. This was something that he observed being thrown again from heaven as if from the hand of God, he said, it was like a great mountain burning with fire that fell into the sea, literally uh, the ocean. 
Now, this is a reasonable description by the Apostle John, then, of, of an asteroid. John doesn't have a word for it. He says it's like a mountain, and it's burning, and it falls into the ocean. It's interesting that scientists identify an asteroid as a mountain-sized chunk of rock hurtling through space. In fact, they track them even now, well over a 1,000 of them. They know their orbits, and they can calculate when they think one may hit the planet. They're saying one will hit the planet in about 2036, somewhere around there. Well, one of these will, in fact, one author explained, if such a rock came toward the earth, the friction of earth's atmosphere would cause it to burn. It'd be a, it'd be a fireball. Astronomers are calculating the orbits of these known asteroids to see if any of them would come close enough to strike the earth. If one happened to land in the ocean, it could, quote, easily produce tidal waves, plural, 1,000 feet high. This ceiling is about 40 feet high. A thousand feet high. Add to that the fact that John describes or records here something that is not just a natural disaster that can be just explained away, but a divine miracle. The water, he writes, turns to blood. The Greek word is haima from which we get our word hema or hematology, the study of blood. This is reminiscent of the plague in Egypt where God turned the water of the Nile into what? Into blood. One can only imagine the staggering death of sea creatures as one third of the ocean is now affected. In fact, John specifically adds at the end of verse 8 that one third of the ships are destroyed. The ensuing uh, tsunamis that come from this, this large mountain this chunk of rock hitting the ocean, that, that's going to capsize ships. Uh, these tidal waves, these mega tsunamis will, will capsize freighters as well as other ocean vessels of all kinds. In fact, it's going to wash coastal cities away. This is not a science fiction movie. This is reality when the judgment of God comes. You can imagine the naval fleets of every major country now severely crippled. You can imagine seafood, which will now be rationed, and coastal regions, depending on fishing, will experience difficulty as food is rationed. People are going to lose their source of income. Their livelihood will be completely lost. God has scorched the earth. In fact, even at this time, many believe that these trumpets are being blown one after another. These first four are almost simultaneous. Uh, They're happening at the same time. A time, as it were, they're battling forest fires on one hand where crops and grass is being burned up as, as earth, its surface, the belief that its mother nature is now being, being scorched. And then the second trumpet comes along and, and, the, and the, the, the very object that mankind believed was the womb of life, the ocean, Uh, The ocean, which mankind has long revered as sort of the womb of Mother Nature, it will now turn and and bring death. You can only imagine dead fish, dead whales, shipwrecked vessels drifting up on the shores of our planet. It would be horrifying. That which man revered seems to have been turned, unleashed upon him. Uh, Verse 10, the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven. He tries to describe it as burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is called Wormwood and a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Now one third of rivers and lakes and natural springs are poisoned. A star falls from heaven. There isn't any reason to take this any other way than literally. In fact, the word star can be used for any heavenly body outside the the moon and the sun, used by the ancients, used in the Bible that way. I found it interesting in researching this a little further to find help, ironically, from the National Geographic Society, a society so well known for its creationism. Uh, This society records that there are only about 100 principles, 100, principal rivers in the world. They range in length from the Amazon, which is about 4,000 miles long, to the Rio de la Plata, which is about 150 miles long. And these 100 rivers supply the fresh water network of the world. In other words, this falling star 
could poison only a few of these principal rivers and, and literally affect one-third of the earth's fresh water network. And did you notice in this verse, the falling star happens to have a name. It's called wormwood, epsinthos. This is the word for a plant that grew in Palestine that had a very bitter, bitter taste. Throughout the scriptures, this did have meaning. It it referred to the, the judgment, the bitter judgment of God. Several times Jeremiah referred to people eating and drinking wormwood as a symbol of eating and drinking the judgment of God. So now... Folks, just try to imagine this scene. Oceans are reeking with blood and death. Coastlines are littered with carcasses. One-third of the earth's surface is on fire. Clean water is nearly impossible to find as rivers and lakes and private wells yield nothing but the bitterness of wormwood. I know one thing. There will be no more Earth Day. There will be no more happy banners to Mother Nature or the planet. The third trumpet impacts Earth's rivers and lakes and freshwater supply. And now, the last of the four in quick succession, the fourth trumpet impacts sun, moon, and stars. Look at verse 12. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon... And a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Now you need to notice carefully, John isn't saying that a third of the sun no longer works. If that were true, earth would freeze in a matter of minutes, I'm sure. Don't know exactly the period of time, but those that I've read said it would freeze over solid in a quick, short amount of time. What I believe John is recording here is that God will only allow the celestial beings that provide light for the planet to operate at a diminished rate of time. Again, this is reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt where God effectively gives mankind his wish. Mankind hates the light. Mankind loves darkness because his deeds are what? Evil. Okay, I'll give you your wish. I'll give you more darkness. This is what's happening here. The human race will go from the normal cycles of light and darkness to only having around eight hours of light a day. By the way, this understanding fits perfectly with the prophecy of Amos, who wrote of this day of judgment. Listen to what he said. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. You can imagine the number of miracles of his sovereign hand as he manipulates the movement of the universe itself. But here's something deeper that's happening. This judgment once again strikes at the idolatry of the human heart. For centuries, in fact, going all the way back to Nimrod, mankind has supposedly gathered direction and wisdom from where? The stars, the sun and moon. The stars and planets have not only been studied, which is a wonderful study called astronomy. They are worshipped and revered and sought after for wisdom, which is the basis of astrology. An entirely different thing. Astronomy is a wonderful science of discovering the far reaches of the universe. And I am amazed when I see the picture sent back by Hubble. The vast creative handiwork of God and astronomers study the calculations of the movements. And it, 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 it does exactly what David said it would do. It, it, it gives glory to God for those of us who believe in him and our creator. But astrology is the belief that a star somewhere out there determines your fate. And so you got to figure out what's happening. And so the horoscopes are, are watched carefully by millions upon millions of people who, who consult them every day. Leaders in nations determine the events of state based on the movements of the stars in our generation, just as in the past. Astrology goes all the way back to Babylon. You consult any book on astrology, and they will take you back to the learning of the Chaldeans, or literally the Babylonians. They were the ones who originally developed the zodiac. Uh, They created the zodiac by dividing the sky into sections and then giving 
by virtue of stars within those sections, meaning. And so a person's destiny is determined by your star, which is in a certain section of the zodiac, which then determines your fate. That sign you've been born under. But someone will say, well, Stephen, didn't God say that the stars were created as signs in the heavens? Yes, God said that in Genesis 1.14. However, the word sign does not mean source of wisdom or even direction. The same word was used for the plagues of Egypt. Moses called them signs. Deuteronomy 29.3. Why? Not because they provided wisdom, not because they gave directive for your life, but because they symbolize the hand of creator God and his judgment. The stars are signs in that they point to the glory of a creator God. Psalm 19.1, they tell of the glory of God. The sun and moon are visual reminders of the power of a creator God. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. But what has mankind done with this? What has mankind done is he's marveled at the moons of sun, moon, and stars. He has revered them. He has gone to them for supposed wisdom. But if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So this is idolatry. This is the replacement of God with a star. You go all the way back to the Babylonians who then perfected this system in Egypt by their application of the zodiac. In fact, the pyramids were constructed with certain mathematical relationships to the stars which they revered and cherished and followed. They were the servants of of the sun. And their pharaoh was simply the offspring of the sun. Archaeologists, in fact, I found it interesting, just as a side note, they found that the Sphinx was, in fact, constructed to preach an astrological message. Just as the capstone of the Washington Monument declares the glory of God, so the Sphinx was designed to declare the glory not of God, but of the zodiac, the stars of the heavens. It has the head of a woman. You've probably seen pictures of it. That represents Virgo. And it has the body of a lion that represents Leo. Virgo is the first sign of the zodiac, and Leo is the last sign of the zodiac. In other words, the Sphinx represented the alpha and the omega of the zodiac, the beginning and the end. In fact, the word Sphinx in the Greek language simply means joining. They believed it was the meeting point of the zodiac. It indicated through the priests, through this construction, that the starting point of all of life on earth began there in Egypt in the womb of the Nile. You can believe that if you want. But I, however, believe the words of this revelation as it comes to a close. And Jesus Christ says in Revelation chapter 21, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. I am, in other words, the starting point of life. It wasn't on the banks of the Nile. It was within the council of triune God. For God created the heavens and the earth. The worship of the stars and planets, by the way, are going to one day utterly, completely collapse. Horoscopes will one day be rubbish, discarded by the millions who tried to follow them. Why? Because God's going to dim the lights. Joel prophesied in Joel chapter 2, verse 10, 31, and chapter 3, verse 15. He says it this way, the sun and moon will grow dark in this day, and the stars will lose their brightness. Mankind has pursued every avenue within nature for wisdom, pursued every avenue for direction, except the creator of nature, our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things were created Nothing was created apart or without him. Colossians 1.10 or 116. And so we go to him. We don't, we don't cause an affront to the sovereignty of God by seeking out some star, some chunk of matter, which will somehow direct our life. What an offensive thing to creator God. No, mankind will. He will seek wisdom from created things rather than the creator. And on this coming day of judgment, God will cause mankind in the darkness to scramble, confused, the cherished and worshipped, the creature rather than the creator, Romans 125, and now their environmental idols, all their ecological sermons, their idolatry of Mother Nature, yes, 
I don't use that flippantly, idolatry, because nature and earth have replaced true worship of our creator. And this creator in this day will turn their idols against them with horrifying effects. There will be no earth day, probably never, ever again. The chapter ends with the appearance of an eagle. My text reads in verse 13, let's look there quickly. Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth, those earth dwellers. That's a phrase used 12 times in the book of Revelation to speak of those who disbelieve God. They dwell on the earth. They live for the earth. They're subjugated by the earth. Woe to them because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. In other words, God here in his mercy is informing everyone on the planet that there's more judgment coming. This is an act of his mercy. So if you're not ready by now, get ready by getting right with God. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth There are three more blasts of trumpets from three angels which are about to come. As Stephen reminded us today, a day is coming when those who revere the earth over the God who created the earth will come to realize that their worship was misguided. They should have worshipped the Creator, not the creation. As this revelation continues to unfold, we have much more to learn. But we need to stop here for today and resume tomorrow. You're listening to Wisdom for the Heart with Stephen Davey. If you had to miss part of today's lesson, you can go back and hear it again on our website, wisdomonline.org. There's a link on the homepage to take you directly to today's broadcast. We also post each lesson on our smartphone app, so be sure and install that. For the last few months, our daily Bible lessons have been available globally on our YouTube channel. Be sure and subscribe to the Wisdom for the Heart YouTube channel if you'd like to access these lessons there. Did you know that one of the best ways you can support our ministry is by sharing it with your family and friends? When you tell others about Wisdom for the Heart, you help to spread the truth of God's Word. Please consider doing that today. On tomorrow's broadcast, Stephen has a lesson from Revelation 9. Join us for that here on Wisdom for the Heart.